Um, please let me know if you have trouble seeing the text on the screen or hearing me. Uh, just you know, feel free to interject um, and also ask questions, please. All right. So I'm trying to make that full screen, but it's not happening, so it's good enough. All right. So it is my pleasure to chat with this morning um, and also just to even be here. Uh, fun fact, back in 2018, I was a local student auditor while I was a PhD student at Rutgers University and the DSFP organized by Adam and Lucien uh, came through town and, and it was a really wonderful experience there. So I want you to also think about uh, the time that you're spending here and not only as you know time to learn, but also you know as a, a preface for years in the future where you can give back to the community and also, you know, share the knowledge that you continue to build here. So it's really exciting to see that I had a chance to chat with some of you earlier, um, and, I, and I hope to chat with many more of you later uh, about the work that you're doing, because I think that, you know, as, as we've heard, machine learning is very ripe for uh, applications in astronomy. Um, and there's a lot of things that I'll be discussing that can be, that, that have use cases way beyond what I've ever envisioned. So it's up to you to make that happen. So again, my name is John Wu. I'm an assistant astronomer, which is a tenure track position at Space Telescope Science Institute, also an associate research scientist at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. And uh, if you want to get in touch with me, I, uh, you, know, you can find me on various social media and or um, on this website here, JWU Physics. Okay, so I actually, before uh, jumping into the convolutional neural network segment, I want to, uh, foray briefly into learning styles. So to get started, this uh, is Bethel, meet Bethel. This is my almost three-year-old daughter. We're at an Orioles game. And since uh, she's almost three, it's a very pivotal time in her life, in my life especially, uh, because there's this great American tradition of learning to play catch with your dad. And that is what I'm excited about. So if I'm thinking about how would I teach my daughter to throw a baseball. How do I teach a kid to throw a baseball? What's the best way to learn about this sort of thing? I know what you're thinking, right? We're, we're all scientists, so of course she needs to start learning her numbers. She's almost three. Uh, she's probably learned her times tables, multiplication, a little bit of algebra, and then that will get her set up for projectile motion, right? So we can start learning uh, some elementary physics. Um, and then, you know, maybe learn a little bit about drag, second order effects. Of course, the, you know, the real meat of this is that she has to master Lagrangian mechanics um, in order to really get the elegant formalism of how to throw a baseball. Uh, this is naturally the way we're gonna go, right? I, I think that, you know, this is an interesting way to do it, or we can think about it the other way, which is you just throw the ball and see what happens. <laughs> And if you can't see clearly, uh, <laughs> that dad there is a Yankees fan, so he deserves it. <laughs> my, my point here is that there are many ways to learn and different people you know, uh, can, can really make the most of different styles. I'm gonna loosely call these top down versus bottom up approaches. And you're getting a flavor of both of these through these lectures. Um, and I want to I want to present things from a top down approach, partly because there's just not enough time to cover all of deep learning and, and the fundamentals of how to you know build up every type of neural network layer and, and all the proofs and things that go into it. But so from the top down, the goal is to implement neural networks very quickly at a high level of abstraction. That is being able to get you to run neural networks, train them and then actually iterate. So just try things right. Run experiments, coding experiments, that's like. Um, and see what works and what doesn't. And through that, the goal is to uh, get a big picture intuition so that you have the general framework of how to apply that to your research problems and, and to totally new research problems. That's very complementary to the bottom-up approach. And fortunately, you know, others have provided a lot of that foundation there, um, whether it's through mathematics, um, understanding the, you know, the definitions and proofs and things that go into why optimization routines work and, you know, and, and rules for machine learning, and finally understanding the boundary cases in, in which you know you expect things to work or not work. Um, and there are other styles other than this, but you should find the learning style that works best for you. And I think that you know if for me a top-down approach really speaks to me because it means that you know I'm able to to quickly apply this and see the machine learning algorithms in action. And from there I can gain intuition for why things like the mathematical proofs uh, are true or, or so on. 
So I think that's about it. Um, oh yeah, that's right. One last caveat too, before I get started into the notebooks, is that there are a lot of things I'm gonna talk about with deep learning, so deep neural networks. That is, there are many, many trainable parameters. And there are some new intuitions that you have to develop. So some of the classical statistics things, like what Viviana had described yesterday, uh, something like a classical bias variance trade-off, some of those, uh, intuitions need to be upended because there are interesting uh, new phenomena that occur in the deep learning regime. So um, I hope to, you know, to, to show some of these when they, they appear, but you should also recognize that many of these things are new, uh, you know, active areas of research. Um, this is one example here. So this is just at a very high level. What you're seeing on the y-axis is the test or train error. There actually, you know, there's no overfitting happening here. And then what you're looking at on the x-axis is the model complexity. That is how many uh, parameters go into the model. And as you increase the model size, right, as we learned with like the KNN example or, you know, decision tree example, if you have uh, a huge number of trainable parameters, you just fit every bump and wiggle uh, in the classical statistical regime. But in deep, very, very deep neural networks, we're talking about like hundreds of millions or billions of parameters, there's actually kind of a secondary descent in the training curves, the learning curves here. Um, and this is sometimes called deep double descent. The, again, active area of research, but totally uh, different than what you would expect from classical statistics. So be wary of uh, interesting new phenomena that happen. And it might not mean that you're doing anything wrong. It just might mean that there are new formulations to be discovered and interpreted. All right. So um, I think, uh, I think the best launching point, if you want to follow along for this notebook, is to jump into, um, so if you go to the GitHub page, there's, there's a couple of ways to go here. I'm going to, I just want to show you how to get there. Um, so if you go into the GitHub page for uh, LSST DSFP session 19, and then you click on day three, hopefully you'll see uh, that there's, you know, there's a readme file, which I think is blank, and then there's this convolutional neural networks um, dot IPI notebook. And if you click on that, there's a chance it won't render. So if that happens, you can just hit refresh. Uh, and then the easiest way to get here is actually this kind of badge right here. This is the notebook I'll be going along. Um, but if you click on this badge, uh, it should actually pull this up in something called Google Colab. A uh, quick show of hands. Has anyone uh, who has used Google Colab before? OK, great. Um, so I'm going to give a brief tour here, and let me just go back to the instance I have running. That's the same. Okay, so um, so let's let's get straight into convolutional neural networks from the top down. Okay, um, um, so the first thing I want to mention is just what the goals of today's uh, tutorials are. So we're going to immediately train up a convolutional neural network, or CNN, as I'm going to abbreviate it, and it's going to be a regression model. Okay, so we're going to try to estimate some sort of variable, uh, which is not uh, categorical, but it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a variable that can take on floating point values. And we're gonna do this via the, the top down approach. That is, we're gonna just train the neural network. It's gonna be, you know, have like 10 million parameters and it's just gonna do its thing. We're gonna build up some intuition for how the convolutional layers work and then learn about some of the other layers that go into the CNN. Um, I then wanna talk about the optimization routine. So how do the neural networks parameters actually get updated? Again, at a pretty high level. And then finally, we're going to try to implement a full training loop from start to finish um, with, uh, you know, with your bar of code. Uh, this, uh, so if you, if you click, by the way, on, on this left panel, just to orient you, there's a table of contents in here. And you can see that there's a lot of stuff in here. Uh, so there, there's actually some optional uh, uh, parts in here, which you can you know, cover at your own pace. And there's even some, uh, some bonus exercises at the end, which actually covers a CNN classifier example. So I may not have time to get to those, but just know that those are there and you're very welcome to reach out if you wanna uh, explore those. Okie dokes. So the first thing we wanna do if we're gonna run this is we're gonna wanna either click this connect to a runtime. So Colab actually allocates you a uh, CPU, it allocates you some memory, it gives you a little bit of storage space, which is not persistent. So if you lose connection or whatever, if that gets severed, um, it will wipe it clean. So you should think of it as a scratch space area. And it even has the option to give you a, a GPU, a graphics processing unit. GPUs are what 
really led to the advent in deep learning, uh, you know, being, being so commonplace. And um, graphics processing unit, as the name implied, you know, we're, we're used to do linear algebra routine support for graphics, um, video gaming, and other types of rendering type things. But that also works very well for the linear algebra required in machine learning, especially with neural networks. And so um, we are going to use Python. Python is going to interface with a low level of GPU uh, language um, of CUDA in this case. And uh, the CUDA code, we're never going to have to write ourselves, but we will use PyTorch and some other libraries built on top of PyTorch in order to get things running. So if you want access to the GPU, I think if you clicked on the Colab link, it should have already by default given it to you. Uh, but if not, you can go to runtime at this top here. By the way, there's sort of this little bar, which I minimize because it takes up too much space. Um, but you can go and click change runtime type here and look at what the options are. Uh, and so in this case, we have, you know, you can even change, uh, you can use R if you want. You can change it from a CPU. You can do there's something called a TPU, which we're not going to cover here, um, a tensor processing unit, and GPU. So this particular type of GPU is an NVIDIA T4. Uh, which is a pretty power efficient, reasonably good GPU. So I'm going to hit connect here. Um, one thing to be uh, to keep in mind is that if you're not using your GPU, uh, Google's going to get mad, and then they might just like shut your thing down. Uh, so so if you basically like leave it idle for a long time, uh, it will they'll probably you know they'll probably shut down your notebooks. So just know that, and you'll have to restart from the top. The other thing is that um, I think there's only like 12 or so hours they allocate per week for free. Uh, typically, GPU prices are some of the order of about a dollar per hour. So they're not going to hand out, you know, like hundreds of hours for free. Um, they used to, but they, they don't anymore. So just keep that in mind as well. Um, but anyway, it should be enough to get us through this notebook. So um, you can see the instructions here. I said we're going to allocate, we're going to use the GPU runtime. And then we're going to install some packages, which I, have uh, you know, showed down here. We're going to get some packages. Um, we're going to use something called Fast AI, which is going to allow us to do the quick high-level framework, jump straight into the code. I'm going to download some image files. Um, so I'm going to provide some just a sample of data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, we've got the imaging survey, which are just these cutouts of galaxies in the G, R, and I optical bands and JPEG format. Um, and then we're also going to grab uh, some value-added catalogs. So these are going to come from the MPAJHU catalogs, which are based off of spectroscopy in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So these have a few galaxy properties. I've really pulled it down to just three essential galaxy properties. I've also hidden the code here because it's kind of ugly, but you know, you can always kind of, you can click on, um, you know, the import statement, the install and import statement here. So if you, you know, click this, it will actually run in the, in the background. It's not going to show it for, uh, for you, but you can also take a look at the code if you want. And in fact, there's a little green arrow that tells you how far along it is. So we're just installing a package called FastAI, which contains PyTorch, again, in order to use the GPU um, and provide some high-level abstractions for uh, the neural network uh, codes. And then we're going to install some stuff. And then I'm going to hide that again. Uh, similarly, I'm going to go and run this, which allows me to just uh, you know, download some things really from a Dropbox uh, files that, that I've got here. And we're going to basically Download those, and then I think untar some of the images so that you can actually look at them. Otherwise, they're just packaged together. But again, you can take a look at that, uh, and hopefully this shouldn't take too, too long. And when all is done, uh, one fun fact that you can do in Jupyter Notebooks and uh, on Google Colab as well is that you can actually run um, commands from the terminal. Uh, so there's you know, Bash or one of these shells uh, running behind the scenes here. And so anytime you start off with an uh, exclamation mark or bang, um, you can actually kind of run various uh, commands. And in fact, if you, look, if you look in here, you can see actually I'm using things like pip, which is uh, you know, also run from the command line um, in, order in, in some of these earlier codes. So you can run this cell here. Um, by the way, so I, you can either click this play button thing, or you can, you, know, you can run shift enter or command enter. I think all of those will allow you to execute the cell. And you can see exactly what we've done. So we've grabbed the catalog of galaxies.csv. We've uh, actually, we've downloaded a tar.gz file, and then we've sort of un, uh, you know, uh, un decompressed that into, uh, this is actually a directory, and in there, there's something like 10,000 Galaxy images. Okay, and so this is what the directory structure looks like. There's galaxy.csv, and then in images, we've got a whole bunch of images. Great. 
Another thing you can run is there's a command that's kind of handy called NVIDIA SMI. Again, this is just sort of showing you what's what's happening here, like in the background, what's happening on the GPU. This is an NVIDIA GPU. So again, you probably don't really need this on, except for debugging purposes, but you can see that, you know, how much RAM is being used on the GPU, how much memory, what type of CUDA version it is, NVIDIA drivers, and, and a bunch of other details. Um, something helpful to monitor if, uh, but, but it's a little hard to do on Google Chrome. Uh, uh, yes. So you, you mentioned like if you use GPU, then it will make faster, right? Indeed. That, that is the main goal of the GPU. The goal of the, yes, yes, sorry, I, I should have made this more clear, yes. Um, so the GPU allows you to really accelerate um, deep neural networks running. Um, so today, because we're gonna train a, a convolutional neural network, which has, you know, a order 10 million parameters, the GPU really, really helps run those operations. So basically a GPU should think of it as an extremely parallel, you know, set of very low power cores. Um, and so they can, you know, run simple commands, like simple matrix multiplications, but in highly in parallel. And so, um, you know, a GPU is gonna have something like thousands of cores, a typical CPU allows you to maybe just run like a few, you know, a dozen threads or so. And so um, that's, that's really the power there. Uh, tomorrow's lecture, I'm gonna talk a bit about graph neural networks, which are, don't need to be as uh, deep. So they don't, basically they don't need to have as many parameters and therefore uh, the GPU actually, I'm, I'm gonna say it's not necessary for tomorrow's lecture. So we're not gonna do that. Um, thanks for the question. Any, any other uh, clarifying points before we get started? All right, well, let's get right into the science question here. So uh, the motivation here, uh, at least that I'm gonna present, is can we predict a galaxy's gas phase metallicity using three color images? We have all the tools, all the data needed to, to answer this question. And in fact, a, a fun connection is that this result was actually, uh, or this science question was probed by, by Viviana Aproviva back in 2016 using uh, you know, catalog-based data, like you have a tabular data set, like something in a table. The question was, can you estimate the gas phase metallicity using photometric properties, like the magnitudes, the colors of galaxies, that is just the differences in magnitudes, stellar mass, photometric redshifts, those kinds of things, and found that indeed, yes, you can to a floor of about, um, you could get it to within an error of 0.08. And right here, I'm using something called a root mean squared error, which, you know, under certain approximations, you could think of as a standard deviation in error, um, basically the scatter there. Uh, and 0.08 dex is pretty low for, um, you know, just photometric properties. Um, but this actually requires a whole bunch of extra information. And the question that we will be asking today is, if you go just straight from the images and give, supply no other information, can you use those images, images of galaxies, and predict the gas metallicity? Roland Tor, by the way, metallicity. Metallicity is the abundance of heavy elements relative to the primordial hydrogen in galaxies. We know that galaxies obtain lots of gas as they form. That gas forms, in, you know, uh, condenses into stars. The stars create heavier metals out of, you know, the lighter elements that they have. And then they expel those elements out into the interstellar medium. And so what we're trying to measure is, you know, an estimate of the global metallicity, the total metallicity within a galaxy um, based on all those processes. So the first thing we're going to do now that we have that question in mind is to take a look at our data. I think it's always helpful to ex do data, uh, you know, exploration, exploratory data analysis, as it's sometimes called. So we can, you know, and I'm going to show the code here briefly. We can uh, take a look at the value added uh, catalog. So here I'm just doing, I'm using a package called pandas, um, which I think was covered yesterday. We're going to use uh, the read CSV command to grab, uh, you know, make a data frame here. And then we are going to just sample five random rows from this, from this data frame. And so you can see here, these are some examples. There's an object ID, which is just the you know, identifier. There's the positions of these galaxies. There's the redshifts of these galaxies. So these are all pretty low redshift. They're all from the Sloan uh, main galaxy sample, which is you know, a magnitude limited sample. And then there's these uh, three parameters here. These are, you can think of these as the median estimates from a model uh, that was you know based on basically a spectroscopic model of a, the galaxy's total stellar mass and log units here so this is the total stellar mass in the galaxy this, this column here sfr to p50 is the log star formation rate in units of solar masses per year and the last one is 
OH, which is log O over H plus 12, which is uh, the gas phase metal list. So that's the target that we're going to try to estimate here, this OH P50. Um, if you remember from Viviana's, uh, you know, warnings, the first thing you should do is, is plot uh, you know, take, take, make a plot of the metallicities here um, because we're trying to estimate this. There's a chance that there's a whole bunch of minus 9999s. Uh, and indeed, actually, in the parent catalog, there were, but I've actually cleaned them out for you so you don't have to worry about them. But it's always good to take a look. So this is just the histogram of the gas metallicities. They say on Mali's between about 8 to 9.2 or so, 8.2 to 9.2. So not a huge range here, but it's good to get a sense of how they're distributed. And then I've also got some code that lets you visualize at you know, some of the actual JPEG images that we've downloaded. So it's taking a little while. Um, so you can see here that we've got, uh, we've sampled um, six galaxies here. And, and um, for each of these, we've got capital Z here is the metallicity. Um, is, 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 so we can see the metallicity. So like something around eight point whatever or nine point something. Um, and that's superimposed on top of each of these galaxy images. So you can get a sense of the diversity of galaxies we're looking at. Even though these are all low redshift galaxies, they're, um, you know, and, and they're relatively uh, high mass, but some of these have, you know, other objects in the same frame. Some of them have, you know, bars and spirals, and some of them are, you know, I don't know, smaller. Okay, so now G Google noticed I'm not using the GPU, so <laughs> starting to get mad, starting to get a little antsy here. Uh, but no worries, we're about to, to go and use that. And so this, this is what the galaxy images look like. Any thoughts or questions? Anything to note? All right, let's get right into it. So we're going to go and train a neural network with FASTA. I'm just going to run the next few cells in quick succession. So what we're going to do is we're first going to create something that loads the data. OK, and I'll go back to this in a moment. The next one, we're going to go and define something called a loss function, basically a, a how much we penalize the errors. We're also then going to create our CNN model, and we're going to wrap it all together in something called a learner, and then we're immediately going to run this command, fit, learn.fit one cycle, and that's where the magic is going to happen. Okay, so while that's doing its learning, I'm going to go back up a few and talk briefly about what's going on here. And again, this is a very high level, so I apologize if things like are not really uh, coming together, not, if, if it's not making sense. Um, but the goal is to, to see how the pieces fit together, and then we're and then we're going to go and look at each of these pieces in detail. So in fast AI, um, again built on top of PyTorch, uh, this there's something called a data block. A data block is kind of a weird concept, but the idea is just how does you want to ask the question, how does data get fed into your model? And when I say model, I mean your convolutional neural network, okay? So the first thing you need to specify is a tuple, a Python tuple of what goes in and out of your, you know, of uh, your model. So what goes in in this case is your images. And then what comes out is you want to regress some quantity. So just, you know, one or multiple values. So there are these, you know, we've downloaded these things called, oh, we've, we've downloaded and imported um, the fast, AI API, which allows you access to this image block or regression block, which is you know why I can just call them like this. We then now, um, again, X. So get X is another thing we can supply to the data block. And this tells you where, are, like, how are we going to load in the inputs? And in our case, we know that the inputs um, are images, right? Those images need, they have names, and we need to somehow tie those names back to the, uh, the catalog metallicities. So actually, just to be clear, you know, if we go up a little bit, we will see that the um, object IDs here, you know, for each row, each which is a galaxy, you've got a, an ID, and you've also got the metallicity, which we're trying to estimate. But this ID is also the same ID uh, that's, you know, found in the images. Like each of the file names for the images is tied to that object ID. So that's sort of the link that we got to make here. And going back down now, um, so, uh, yeah, so the number of images in the folder are same with the number of objects, right? Uh, yeah, or at least, uh, I guess it, that's sort of the minimum number that can be there. But if you want to look in the, the idea is that, you know, for the catalog, uh, you want to make sure that at least everything that's in the catalog, which has a metallicity, you also have an image of that. 
Otherwise, we can make a cut on our catalog and just remove those other things for which we don't have good estimates of the metallicity or don't have images. So that's the input to get X. We're, we're using, again, another function. And this basically just says that it's going to, you know, this is the, like, this is the path, like the location of how to find the, uh, the image that it needs to open. And so it does all that in the back end. We're not going to do the file IO. There's a lot of complexity and all that stuff. And I don't want to get, you know, stuck in the weeds there. But that's basically how that's working. And again, Y is just saying grab from, you know, this data frame, the OHP50 column. Uh, that's, again, the metal SD. Splitter tells you just how do you randomly split the train and validation set. So this is just, um, again, another convenience function called random splitter. Um, we can provide it a random seed. So it's you know, making the same split between train and validation. We're not doing cross-fold validation here, just a single 80%, 20% split. And then finally, um, we're doing a couple of transformations, which um, aren't super important right now. But the idea is that we want to make sure that all of the images have exactly the same size. This is critical for GPUs in order to run things in parallel. If, you know, your images all have different sizes, then it won't be able to allocate memory in a predictable way. Uh, so it needs to all be the same size. So we've resized all the images to 160 by 160 pixels. And then we actually randomly crop, um, or not, I'm sorry, we, we crop from the center of the image, 144 pixels. So they're all the same size, they're all 144 by 144 pixels. And then we do a whole bunch of transformations in batches, basically a whole, a whole bunch of the images at a time. We do random, uh, you know, basically random reflections across the Y and X axis. We don't do any other rotations other than that. And there are some other things in here that we don't do. So again, I, I know there's a lot of pieces in there, but the idea is this is telling us how do we load the data and how do we quickly pre-process it? Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. That's right, yes, yes. To repeat, we're gonna train a convolutional neural network and directly from the images or the you know the photometric imaging, we're gonna to try to estimate the metal SD, which is typically derived from spectroscopy. So we're gonna to try to bypass the spectroscopy and have all the model-based estimates there. Uh, was there another question? Yeah. Yeah, so when trying to make the same size images, what's what's better because what's your better resolution? Mm -hmm. To yeah. The yeah. No, that's a great question. I mean, so the question, right, is is if close by galaxies are going to, you know, either be blown up larger, should we impose it the same angular size, which is what we are doing here? Um, so there's a constant pixel size in, in the angular units, or do we want the same physical size? Um, in our case. There, well, there's two reasons that I might stick with the, the approach that we're doing here to use the same angular size. The first is that the rest, the angular resolution also sets your, you know, ability to resolve things like stars or, or H2 regions or, or parts of the galaxies, which are, you know, physically meaningful. And so if that changes, then it can be a little tricky. Um, but, you know, I, I, I see your point. Um, the, what was the second reason? I was going to say something else. Um, I think the second reason, oh, the second reason is that we're trying to actually work with just photometric properties. So, and so if we don't actually know the distance to the galaxy, if we use like something like a photo Z or something, we're adding a second model that, you know, makes it a little harder um, to determine what, you know, how that was derived. Um, or if we already have the spectroscopy, you know, there's a chance we already know what the, the metallicity is uh, in addition to the redshift. So it's sort of just like an information, like what do we have available to us? Um, Okay, so again, so data block uh, is is able to load the data very quickly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Uh, what is the point of augmenting the batches there? Um, it's it is optional, and the goal here is basically to build model robustness to. Um, you know, various transformations. So for instance, if you flip your galaxy, you know, over the Y axis or the X axis, you wouldn't expect that to have any impact on the metallicity. You're just viewing it at a different angle. And in fact, if you were to rotate it, 
you know, subject to various pixel interpolation effects and things like that, you also wouldn't expect that to change the properties of the galaxy. So there are certain, you know, and there are certain invariances that the images have, and we're going to talk actually a lot more about that tomorrow with graph neural networks, but the invariances in this case, we're just going to learn via that data augmentation. It's an approximate way to learn the invariance. So it's basically what That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And these are very sort of harmless transformations, right? Like you're, you're not, um, you're not losing any, any, you're not changing pixel values. You're just changing locations. Yeah. So can you use this to expand your data set? Uh, the answer is definitely yes. Yeah. So one, one of the benefits of data augmentation, in addition to building robustness to those invariant transformations, is that it expands your sort of training set. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's a little bit empirically driven, right? And and if you actually go and work on, you know, terrestrial data, like or other other things that aren't like galaxies and in, in which you're not trying to do a scientific process people just have come up with all sorts of interesting augmentations that are like totally ad hoc. Like they'll just remove random chunks of the image and they'll be like, Oh, I can still tell it's a dog because you know, I can see it's tail or like, or like, and like do all these kinds of things. We, we don't want to do those kinds of transformations, but they definitely exist. There's a whole, you know, world, there's a whole subfield of, of how to design trans, you know, data augmentation in order to, to make your training set effectively larger. Is there a question? Um, all right, I'm going to continue then uh, to our next jam-packed self. So we define here a loss function. So again, loss function is just tells us, you know, what is the penalty whenever we get an error, whenever we, you know, make a prediction. We, uh, so in our case, predictions, I'm going to loosely call those P's, and then the Y's are the, the target value, the, the known ground truth. Um, in this case, that's the metallicity, right? So our predicted and true metallicities, we basically are going to use a root mean squared error. Um, they have to be in this PyTorch format because they actually need to keep track of the the, deriv the partial derivatives with respect to the par parameters models. And so that's why it's not just like a numpy dot square root or whatever. Um, there's, you know, we'll get into that in a bit. We're going to create a convolutional neural network model called X ResNet 18. Um, there's some bells and whistles in here, so don't worry too much about that, but just know that this is a deep neural network. And in fact, I can show you how many layers it has. If you just type this, you can see all the PyTorch layers, and there are lots in here. And each of these layers are gonna have like thousands or tens of thousands of parameters. So this adds up, you know, to, to several million. Okay, this is crowding my screen now. Let's delete that cell. And then we do something called fit one cycle. So what is happening with fit one cycle? Uh, again, we'll get into it in a, in a second, but we're gonna train multiple epochs, that is full passes where all the data are sampled, all the training set is sampled. They're gonna be pulled in in chunks or batches. They're gonna get fed into the model. The model is gonna ingest that data. It's gonna make a prediction. It's gonna then evaluate using a loss function. It's gonna say, oh, you're wrong by this much. And then it's going to make an update to all of the neural network weights simultaneously. And it's going to say, based on effectively calculus and the chain rule, this is how much every parameter should update in order to make your, your loss lower, right? We're going to optimize this by basically making the loss as low as possible and making the error as low as possible. And what are all the adjustments we need to make to every neural network in order to make that happen? Um, so that's called the forward pass, which is making the predictions, and then the backward pass, which is uh, making the adjustments to the model parameters. We're going to do go through 10 epochs, and we're going to basically say, how big of an adjustment are we making? That's called the learning rate. Um, this is a very important hyperparameter when training neural networks, and so we just set this to 0 0.01. And we train in 10 epochs, and you can see that we achieve... Um, you know, a, a final uh, root mean squared error. This, by the way, is a table that just handily tells you, you know, summarizes the training as it happens, 
how much time did it take to pass through each epoch? What is the training loss and the validation loss at this point? And you can see that the blue curve is the training loss and the uh, orange curve is the validation loss. So there's a lot of scatter towards the beginning of the model. It's actually doing quite poorly. And then it's actually continuing to learn. So in fact, I bet if we, if we continued for training for a couple more epochs, it actually might continue to learn even better. But we can do basically about 0.09 dex in the root mean squared error. Um, in some of the training runs I had run, I did actually did better, but anyway. Yep. Um, where did they I'm sorry. So what are the iterations here? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. So iteration here is actually the number of batches that go in. And so what's what's actually happening is that you've got, you know, we've got, uh, I should have taken a look here, but I think we have like 10,000 or 14,000 galaxies. You can quickly look if you do type df.shape. Let me just do it right now. Ugh. df.shape. Okay. How many do we have? We have 14,000 galaxies. There's seven columns. So we can't fit all 14,000 images in memory at once. Uh, that will definitely overload the GPU. Uh, also, by the way, if you ever get an out of memory error on, G on the, your GPU, like in, in the notebook, you basically have to restart because it just screws up everything. <laughs> so <laughs> be wary of that too. Um, so 14,000 is far too many that you can put on the GPU at any given time. Um, and so instead, what we did is if you look in, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a line here. Uh, we created the, the basically the data loaders, which tells us, how, you know, the actual things that load the data. So we created a data block before, which tells us how would you load the data in principle. Then we basically feed that into this image data loaders object, which also then says, okay, now using this data frame, which contains the catalog um, and the, the path variables that tell you how to get to the images and load in chunks of 128 images at a time. So there are 128 um, images per batch uh, and there are 14,000 uh, images total. So the number of iterations is, is 14,000 divided by 128. So that's how many iterations there are. So sorry for skipping that part. Um, and then finally, we stick this. Uh, so device equals CUDA just basically means stick it on the GPU. Yep. Uh, yeah, the, the one down here. It's starting to converge. Yeah, it actually, in this case, I think we got a slightly bad random initialization. It actually usually is able to converge better than this in about 10 epochs. But uh, you can effectively look at, I think maybe Viviana had drawn some of these things. Um, uh, basically, if you look at the training, basically, if you look at the loss as a, you know, let's say iteration or epoch. What, we'll, what you'll often see is something that looks a little bit like this. Right? And maybe something that looks like this. Um, and this is the, let's say, let's say validation, validation loss, and this is the training loss. Can you see this, by the way, or is this kind of too small? Acceptable. Okay. So um, what often happens is that they will both start to decline as, as we see here on the screen. And then after a certain cutoff, it's possible that the validation loss can start to go up and diverge from the training loss. And in fact, if you keep training beyond that, the training loss might actually keep going down. In fact, this is often the case, you know, and, and so whether or not this, you know, validation loss and training loss, you know, stay flat or start to go up or start to go down a little bit, really what you're worried about is the divergence between these two. This is uh, signifying that the model is overfitting. It's perhaps starting to memorize the training data set. And in which case, it no longer is robust to the validation data set. What we're seeing here, we've only trained for 10 epochs, which is actually quite a, a small amount of training time um, for deep neural networks. Uh, but in this case, you know, where we're not seeing that divergence there, these two curves are really closely following each other towards the bottom here. And so maybe if we train for another 10 epochs, maybe we would start to see the behavior, you know, sort of like over here. But right now, we're kind of in this regime here, and we've decided to cut it off. Yeah, yeah. So there, there are a couple of um, heuristics that people have used. Uh, so, you know, it, it, there, there are actually a lot of heuristics. Um, generally, what's helpful to do is to monitor these kinds of things. There are tools, like there are 
from M uh, machine learning operations, which is its own field, software engineers will have like dashboards and things like that to monitor the training first um, and just be able to either save the model at, you know, every, at the end of every epoch and say, at some point you realize that the model is no longer robust, right? It's, it's, it's starting to overfit and then they'll just throw those away and they'll, they'll stop the training there. There are other things that you can do, like you can actually decrease the learning rate at various uh, things, or you could basically have, um, the PyTorch enables you to just call off the model and say like, we're done training if the loss is no longer improving. If the, if the validation loss doesn't improve for like five epochs or 10 epochs, you have to determine the heuristic, but you can set those sorts of rules and say, we're no longer training. Like you've already learned as much as you can. So yeah, does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Yep. I'm just wondering about the, um... Resolution of the validation curve is that just the result of the small sample size? Is the uh, sorry, when you said resolution of the just in terms of kind of the, the roughness, whereas so the training set has this kind of fine grained structure. Oh, yeah, in multiple points. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. It, well, that's actually because um, we because we don't want to reiterate through the entire validation, um, you know, uh, set like after every single iteration. Um, each of these blue points is actually for each iteration, aka just a single batch at a time. So yeah, so there's going to be again, um, you know, fourteen thousand or whatever this divided by batch size is one twenty eight. So they're going to be at one hundred and nine iterations per batch, uh, or sorry, per epoch, right? So one epoch is a full pass through the data. We're going in batches of 128. So we're just doing chunks of 128 at a time. So therefore we go through this 109, maybe 110 times. The last one's gonna have some extra. Uh, and so, yeah, so, so we're gonna have, you know, 100 times the, the resolution in the blue curve compared to the, the orange one. Yep. Treating, do we use the same subset of training and validation set or do we select in between two applications? Uh, so the question is, you know, when I'm when I'm training, you like running these six same experiments. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of tricky. You optimally, if you want to see the adjust, like if you change certain hyperparameters in your model, and you also change the split in validation training, then it's a little hard to tell what actually amounted to, you know, the difference that you see in the end result. So it's helpful to set a seed in terms of the training and validation split. It's also helpful to just randomly initialize the model, model parameters because in the beginning, they just have totally random values. So you actually, if you run that a few times, then you can get a sense of what the typical scatter is due to all those different variables. Um, but while holding you know, one of those things constant, um, which is the training validation split. So that, that does help, but you know, there are also reasons why you might not keep that constant. Yep. I'm so sorry. I, I don't know. Yeah. That is that is a great question. One that I don't think anybody knows the full answer to. Uh, but no, that's a great question. And and in fact, in the in the paper that is, is cited here, that is one of the the hypotheses. Like, does it learn the stellar mass and use those to sort of estimate the metallicity? And the, the answer seems to be no. But it, it's not trivial that 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 doesn't seem to be the case. Um, it's it, it's basically complicated. I mean, galaxies are complicated things. The, you know, a lot of things correlate with other, you know, a lot of their properties correlate with other properties. And so it's, it's kind of hard to, to detangle all of this. I'm actually going to go back to the slides, I think. Um, uh, let me just make these predictions real quick and show you, um, you know, you can basically look, this is just another helpful plot to, to visualize here. So, oh yeah, so I'm making, getting all the predictions here. So this gives you the, the, the true and the predicted metallicities. And then we can just make a scatter plot of these. And you can see like, there's this rough correlation here. Sorry, it's like, I'm like trying to make things fit on a screen, but also the font size to be good. Um, and so this is, you know, this is how how well we do. Yes. So um, you make a fit for one cycle and you train it in 10 epochs. Oh yeah, um, the nomenclature is kind of wacky. Yeah, yes. so the, the cycle, yeah, I'm sorry, I should have explained that. Um, Fitting, so the cycle is actually like a learning rate schedule. And, and so I'm gonna cover that later as well. 
again, it's it's these, these there's just a lot of magic going on right now. It's, it's, it's kind of what I'm trying to show. But through that, you know, you should be able to like one way to learn. And this is helpful for me uh, uh, when I was first getting started. It's just like changing that, you know, and, and trying to de delete various parts or like, you know, change this to, you know, 0 0.1 and see what happens. Right. Or you, you can you can modify a lot of these. There's a, there's something called just fit, which is just fitting out a constant learning rate, which is which is probably a little more what people think about. The one cycle scheduling is it's this whole you know the whole series of papers on that. So I'm not I'm not going to bother going into it. But that's another experiment you can run. It turns out that fit one cycle it tends to work much much better um, in terms of quickly learning. Um, it also allows you to learn at higher learning rates, which allows you to make bigger adjustments to the model parameters. So empirically, it's been shown that that trains your model much, much faster. Um, just to give you like a baseline, like typically when people train neural networks, they would have to do something like 100 epochs um, or like, like a, a, of, of a data set of this size, maybe between 50 to 100 epochs is what you would expect for convergence. But we can often get it to under like 10 or 15 epochs um, here. Okay. I'm gonna go back to the slides if uh, there are no other questions. And then I'm gonna to try to go through the slides quickly, which is gonna hopefully illuminate a little bit more about the CNNs. And then, uh, and then we're gonna have our first break, I believe. Okay, sound good? All right. I don't know why I can't full screen this, it's so weird. Let me do it. Ah, cool, CNNs. Okay, so. I feel obligated to show you this, you know, textbook, biology textbook picture of a biological neuron uh, because artificial neurons, I'm sorry, is this hard to see by any chance? I just wonder, if you can go to your settings and just hide your, you, sorry, you want to you go to the full screen. Okay. No, this won't matter. So if you go to more and you zoom. More and zoom. And you hide video panel. Ah, yeah. And then you can also do hide floating controls. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I had no idea. You could go. <laughs> now, when you do slideshow, we'll be able to read all the text. Oh, wonderful. Sorry, no. No, yeah. Thank you. That's that's really good to know. Um, so again, this is a a biology you know textbook picture of a biological neuron. And so, what is a neuron? It's it's a cell, as you can see in this upper uh, left side here. It's a cell that has these things called dendrites. They're basically these little spindly things that take in electrical signals. So the signals go into the cell, somehow in the cell, you know, in the nucleus uh, or the cell body, you have some sort of processing, which enables you to perhaps output a cell, uh, a signal. And that's kind of being shown on the right through this thing called the axon. That then allows it to connect to other biological neurons and they receive the input if this thing fires one, okay? So that's a biological neuron, it turns out that biological neurons are kind of grouped together in sensible configurations that allow them to perform high level tasks, things that are not just like firing random pulses of electricity, but rather doing things like, you know, detect the visual cortex, like things like vision or, or go to reasoning or maybe higher order things. Um, basically like the grouping together of neurons in order to do mo more coherent tasks is, uh, is, is important here, and it's going to also play into the way that we design um, our artificial neurons and artificial neural networks. Uh, I thought there was another thing here, but okay. So this is like an artificial neuron here where you can also propagate signals, much like what we just saw. Um, the inputs here, I'm going to call Xs. They're going into this, the artificial cell body, which in this case is really just a matrix multiplication. So you've got your X, you know, you can think of it as, as like a vector, uh, and then it's basically being multiplied by a matrix of weights. I think some of this was, was covered in uh, atoms of perceptron lecture essay. And then an activation function, basically something that is nonlinear can be applied to the output there. And this is uh, kind of similar to the firing of a biological neuron. Okay. So, and then similarly, you can group together layers or basically just a whole bunch of these artificial neurons together and you can have them operate in sequence, which allows them to come up with more complex representations of whatever the inputs are into the outputs. But we're interested in working with data that comes uh, on a pixel grid. So input images here now are shown in blue. This is just a, you know, you can see these are like the pixels in an image. Uh, and what a convolution is really doing is it's just finding morphological features. That's what you should think of. They're looking for shapes, patterns and shapes 
and they're trying to, to learn them or match them. So the convolution operator, in this case, I'm using this like X with a circle around it, um, is basically that like you have this morphological feature, which is actually also just an image. You can think of it as an image or a filter. And it's got some particular shape, you know, in these three by three pixels, it's representing a shape and it can scan across the image. It can basically cover a part, part of the image and say, how similar is that morphological feature to the underlying image, right, at that location. And if it's very similar, then it'll take on a high value that's being shown in the green here, this very light green. And if it's a low value, then it'll be something like a zero, okay? So if we then scan across this image, we take this morphological feature, this you know convolutional kernel, there are a lot of names for this, I, I apologize. We can then build up a representation or a map of the outputs. How similar is that convolutional filter to every single one, uh, to the, each of those locations on the input image. And so the output here is the map of features. Uh, and again, we actually run this through a nonlinear function. So I've got a little F here, which then, you know, it, it, effectively the, the reason for that is that you can then learn more complicated uh, types of representations. And then after we do that, we actually are left with a, almost like another image. This is a, sometimes called a feature map but you, you could think of it as an image of that feature. And that, that image is saying how much of this filter was present at each location of the input image. And your output image, the green one there, you can actually then pass it into the next layer of your convolutional neural network. You can imagine learning more complicated features that are like, okay, well, what kinds of features of features can I now find in that second layer of the neural network and look for those? And then you can go into a third layer, which looks for features of features of features and so on. So you can basically imagine stacking a whole bunch of these convolutional layers together to come up with very complicated representations of just pixels, local pixels, things that are near each other. And you can gradually you know, build up this, uh, this hierarchy of, of, of uh, image features. And finally, basically at the end, you are left with, uh, I, I've represented it here like this. It's, you can think of this as you know, basically a whole bunch of types of abstract features I'm giving I'm giving names to them here, point source like how asymmetric is the galaxy, you know, how, how, you know, how much do we see tidal tails or tight winding spirals. In reality, it's not as interpretable as this, but you can think of them as like abstract weird combinations of these things that maybe can be interpreted in the image. And it says, you know, the convolutional network comes up with a feature vector at the way end that says, you know, how much of each of these kinds of features am I finding? And then how do I then take a combination of those sorts of things and make a final prediction by using that final feature? And in fact, this set of features, I, I've purposely represented this like, you know, rows in a column. So you can imagine if you have like 10,000 galaxies, you've got 10,000 rows and each of those columns is gonna tell you the different types of features. You can imagine passing that into a decision tree or like to something else. And in fact, that's work that has been done. People have actually just used the, these convolutional layers, which are sort of shown in the middle of this schematic here, to produce a whole bunch of features, you can do this via, you know, there's, there are methods called like self-supervised learning, all these sorts of things that allow you to, to just take the images and map them onto some random features. And then you can then use other methods to see what you want to do with those features. Like you can pass them through a decision tree um, or KNN or something like that. And so this is really how I think of neural networks, CNNs especially. They're just sequences of morphological feature finders. They, the, the deeper a convolutional neural network is, the more potential it has to create uh, more complex you know, representations of things because you get to combine a lot of different high level uh, abstractions, a lot of these different features. And if you have a shallow neural network, then you just don't have as much opportunity to piece together, you know, to, to come up with features of features of features. And then finally, you can put that together to make a prediction. All right, so that's sort of the, the black box of CNNs. Um, I, there are ways actually that they can be a little bit interpreted, but it's still, you know, there, there's, there's a lot to be said, I guess, on that. And, and I think that like in, from a scientific perspective, it's very challenging oftentimes when we try to interpret the outputs of a neural network. But I, I would say that, you know, these kinds of CNNs can be probed. You can sort of interrogate them and see what makes them do certain types of predictions and things like that. But it's not always obvious to say like it made this prediction because of X. Okay, so I think I'm gonna leave it at that for now. This is the, uh, 
This is, oh yeah, yeah, I guess I should take so, some questions, yeah. So you uh, showed in the last slide that there are different layers. Right? Yeah. To uh, analyze the input effect. So is it the process all the time same or all the time the layers process are different? Like that, right? Yeah, so I mean, the way that you can think of it is if your input, your, your input image is, you know, Let's say it's like this grid of pixels, right? Each of them, and right, like this grid of pixels has numbers in it, right? Like, so let's go like 0 0.1, 0 0.4, blah, blah, blah. Um, you're then applying the first convolutional layer to it. So, com one, you're going to pass, you know, some sort of activation function to it. So, activation one. And then, you know, you, you can do other things, and then you're going to then operate another convolution. On it, com two, and then you know you're basically doing this. It's you're chaining together a whole bunch of, of of these operators and so on. And this is your output. And we're going to call this y at, and we can call this x. So this is essentially what's going on here. You know your inputs, your outputs. Y hat. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, I, I call it p in the notebook. So let's just call it p. P for prediction. And then you basically have. You know, for each X, you have a Y, which is like the target, it's the metal SD. P is your predicted metal SD. You then, you know, you can then operate it like like such, which is what I'm trying to show here. So like it's an iteration of the same process or it is also modifying like the like the prediction or true updating there or something like that. You're um you're making intermediate, you're do you're basically doing these operations, you're just making uh you know, you're computing a bunch of numbers here, right? And these are these are basically like, and, and you're just continuing to compute a bunch of numbers until you've got this one, right? Like, because uh, it's sequential, you have to keep track of it until you get to this point. And then, you know, you throw all those away because they're just intermediate products of, of what you're computing. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can. You can. Um, it's they're tricky to interpret because they tend to be weird combinations of like like of the features I put here. I'm like, oh yeah, maybe it's something like how points are, it's like how whatever things things are. But they're actually like very strange combinations of these things. And so it's like you're kind of mix mixing things. You may be able to somehow decorrelate those features and that come up with something interpretable. But that that takes a lot of engineering. There's something you know uh, that goes under the name of Google Deep Dream, which is like you can actually take the trained neural wave. Like you might say, oh, the convolution, you know, in the second layer, I want to pull this thing out. Then you can actually, you can. Uh, this is too complicated. But you can basically you can grab this layer and you can say, what if I change this whole thing up so that I can get the, I can basically choose x. I can optimize an input image that gives you exactly what you know triggers this convolution the most. And that tells you what is happening in that layer. Because, and then it dreams, you know, comes up with these weird concoctions of input images that really um, cause this to activate the most. And then doing so, you can actually look at the individual features. But it's very, very computationally expensive. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's a great question. So there are, you know, there's a G, R, and I band here. So there's, so it's actually a three by one forty-four by one forty-four image. Um, so actually, so these convolutions aren't just in two dimensions; they're actually in three dimensions. So it receives as input, you know, like. So this is the 2D sort of projection version, but actually simultaneously learns a, like you know three dimensions in addition, or a, a third channel dimension in addition to the two pixelized dimensions of the convolution. Um, then it outputs, you know, for each layer, it will come up with one set of features. But you actually can currently learn a whole bunch of these, right? You you might want to learn like 16 or like 100 features that operate on this thing and, the, and on this input, and they all learn different types of features. So then actually at, at this point, the inputs at this point are three by 144 by 144. Sorry, you probably can't fully see this, but 
Um, and then if your convolution, you know, produces, and if you have like 16 of these convolutions, then at this point, it's actually 16 by, and this will probably be a smaller number, by whatever, you know, pixel size. Um, so I'm just going to call it, I don't know, uh, M by M. Um, and, and actually, you basically can come up with, you know, depending on how many features you're trying to learn in each layer, you actually increase the number of channels. Uh, and, and we're actually going to see more of that in a bit. I imagine there are like sub features in these images that like play a really into the decisions you're talking about. Like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know this, but like, yeah. say that binaries, being binary in a single galaxy doesn't affect diversity. Mm -hmm. um, I could see like see it in like this learning theory class for computation and trying to do analyses there. Yep. Is there a way to like build your CNN? Yeah, yeah. So, are, is there a way to like guide the you know the learning process? Um, I don't not fully. I mean, so so really, what you were in all deep learning, you're just learning from the data, right? So, and the machine learning algorithm is going to be the laziest, you know, try to find the shortcuts as much as it can. And it will, it will basically, you know, because it's determined by this optimization function, this loss function, it's just going to do whatever it takes to, opti you know, minimize the loss. So that often means that when you learn to like, let's say predict the metallicity, that may mean that that CNN is, is garbage for doing a lot of other tasks that are relevant for galaxies. Uh, and so, you know, and so, so that's why they can't just be sort of applied in context outside of which they're trained because they really try to optimize that one objective. Um, so anyway, but there are ways to regularize that and, and sort of make it a little more generalizable. Those, those kinds of things are, are possible. No. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Yep. So during the break, um, I did have a, a few questions. So I just wanted to cover uh, some of the, again, like how things are flowing in and out of the CNN. Um, so I, I apologize again, if it's a little small, but just to kind of reiterate, like what do we have? Like, what do we know? We have our X's and Y's here. The X's are images, right? They're just basically matrices or, you know, tensors or whatever. They're just these high dimensional arrays. And then Y's in this case are the ground truth spectroscopically derived metallicities. Um, so X has dimension like three by 144 by 144, three channels, color channels, uh, by 145 by 144 pixels. Y's in this case is just a single number, right? It's a, it's a scalar. Now, what actually happens is you have a big list of 14,000 of each of those. And so we're gonna first, we get a batch from each of those. So let's say our batch size is 128. So then I, I call this in purple XB, which is going to be 128 by 3 by 144 by 144. So pretty high dimensional, a lot of numbers. Running around. And Y, our batch of ground truths, is going to be 128 by 1. It's just going to be you know, a, a series of ground truth metallicities for each example. Okay. We have our CNN. And in fact, in the beginning, it's randomly initialized. It just has totally random parameters. So it's going to try to learn things like this convolution that you see on the screen, but it's going to give you total garbage because it has like totally random values. And so and then it makes predictions, which are also garbage. Then you take, you know, your 128. So this predictions, by the way, these P's are 128 by one. You basically have a loss function. In this case, the root mean squared error, which evaluates how well did we do? And it says you did terribly. 
you got, you know, you're basically wrong on every front. And if you scroll through the, um, and you can do this on your own time, but if you scroll through the notebook, you can see, for example, um, as you implement this code, uh, that you will actually make, you can compare a histogram of the predictions to the ground truths. If you look at the values down here, the predictions are all about zero. They're just, they're just random numbers multiplied by, you know, these images, which doesn't work out much. And so it predicts a whole bunch of zeros. The true values are supposed to be distributed around nine or so, you know, metallicities of like 8.8 .8 or nine. And so the average error that you're lost is going to be like, you're very, very wrong, right? By, you know, you're, you're about nine decks off. So then what happens, and this is, by the way, this all on the purple here is called the forward pass of the CNN. So you're, all you're doing is running, you're putting things through the CNN, which is totally random, like initially, randomly initialized. You produce the loss function. And then the loss function, in addition to the optimizer, then says, okay, how much do I need to look at my CNN parameters? How much of the CNN parameters do I need to update? And you know, in which directions, like which parameters need to be increased, which parameter values need to be decreased. And if we do that, then you know, can we make this neural network a little bit better? And that's exactly what happens. And so concretely, what these are the parameters. Like see, see this red outline thing in this box here? These are like the parameters of the neural networks. It's the convolutional filter, like the shape that is trying to be learned. They're totally random in the beginning, but they will start to take hold. Like they'll take form over many, many epochs of training and turn into some, you know, visually meaningful combination of parameters. And so maybe in the beginning, they're all just like around zero, but then hopefully by the end of training, there's something a little more useful there. So at this point, this is called a forward pass. And so then you basically come up with CNN, you know, at iteration, we'll call it I plus one, you know, which, uh, is the updated version of the old one, CNNI, and then you have a slightly better CNN. And so then that goes, and you can imagine then going through and doing another forward pass, okay? So, I mean, you can, you can go back and say, okay, that feeds back into over here. So blue in here is what I'm calling, or I'm sorry, blue is the backwards pass. This is where the update steps happen. It's called backward because you're like literally in this flowchart, you're going backwards. And then here's the forward pass up here in purple. And what you would do after running through this one batch, this is now called an iteration. One iteration is a forward and a backward pass of a batch. You then have to grab a new batch. You're not going to use that same batch and just memorize it. Uh, you're going to grab a new batch, you know, from your 14,000 objects. You got another 128 examples of images and metallicities, and you pass it through. You know, in the beginning, it's like, okay, you, you got an error of nine. That's like very bad. And then if, if you slightly update the parameter values to get a slightly better, you know, uh, prediction when you put in the new batch, and then maybe it's like 8.8. .8. And so then you go and then you evaluate the loss. It says it's 8.8, .8, but you could do better. And this is how, again, a lot of magic in the how, but it's, it's really just, um, you know, it, it, it's basically just, uh, uh, a lot of partial derivatives and stuff. And then you basically go back and then, you know, you, you grab yet another batch. And this is why the loss curve goes down with, you know, over the course of many, many iterations and through the epochs. So an epoch, you should just think of as a full pass through the data. But really what's happening is that every iteration, you're making updates to the CNN. The CNN is a parametric model. So those parameters can be updated. Um, and then you just continue to go through your data set again and again. So it gets better. So in each iteration, uh, it's taking 128 randomly from the main data. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's grabbing 128 examples and ground truth labels or targets uh, from the data. Okay. And it, yep, yep. So resolution effects are tricky and it's like, um, unless you already know what features you're going to be looking for, it actually, you know, it's not trivial to do that other than just to train a whole bunch of neural networks at different resolutions. 
uh, which is already then going to be computational expensive. So I'm not sure I have a great answer to that, uh, but it is true that you know at some point limited you know like your resolution can only gets you so far. There's also representational power of the CNNs because you might need to use more powerful, like more deep and, and you know, larger CNNs in order to, to get uh, a good representation of a higher resolution image. So then, you know, there's a lot of factors at play there because you're, you're starting to vary a number of those factors. Any other questions? Okay. In that case, um, so understanding convolutions, I sort of covered this in my slides, so I'm going to skip this here. Let me just say a few very quick things, and you know, feel free to follow along or just tune me out and like evaluate the code, do whatever you want. But the uh, on the activation functions again, like I think we kind of covered some of this. But you, the, if you actually were to just take those neural network layers, they're they're linear operations, right? This convolution is actually a linear operation, and what I mean by that is that if you actually put a convolution you know, and then you, you operate on it again with another convolutional layer, you actually can express that as just a single convolution or a single linear operation. This is like, you know, based on a linear algebra, but the idea is that if you keep doing linear operations in a row, you can trivially represent it just as a single big, big matrix somewhere. And there's no point in having multiple layers. Your deep neural network is effectively just a single layer. What breaks the linearity is by applying some sort of function that goes beyond it. So, um, so like the ReLU, the rectified linear unit is an example of that, which is basically just to say, if you have some input X, you know, your ReLU of X looks like, if it's negative, it stays at zero, and if it's positive, it's just linear, right? It's super trivial, and it's just, you know, it's just like an if statement. If less than zero, you return zero, otherwise uh, return X. Uh, but it actually, you know, allows you to express very, very complex things in conjunction with the convolutional neural network because those two things break the linear sort of like the linear representation of things, and so you can get very tr non-trivial features uh, learned by the CNN. Um, there are other types of uh, activation functions or non-linear functions, but uh, that's just the one I'm going to start with here. Um, I'm just going to skip batch normalization, but it turns out that as you are putting in batches of data, they might have different means and standard deviations. And sometimes it's helpful for your convolutional neural network to basically keep a, a track of like the running mean and standard deviation so that it's not, you know, if you happen to get a batch that has like some very, very bright objects, bright galaxy images, like it doesn't like flip out and, you know, basically learn something bad. But batch normalization is just one of these empirical tricks that you know was discovered back in like 2014 or 15 to, to really stabilize the training of neural networks. There's something called a pooling layer, and um, pooling layer is really just a simple concept. It's just saying like if I have something that's 144 by 144 pixels, like I need a lot of parameters, and I need you know it's a lot of it's pretty heavy weight, and it might end up being that you actually can just you know take a two by two block of those and grab that average of those, right? Like you combine your pixels together, you bin them or do whatever in a way such that, you know, you're reducing the size of your image. Um, this is really done partly actually uh, by, by, by the question uh, we just heard with, about like, you know, what's the point of having uber high resolution images? Um, at some point, actually, you know, as you're creating these feature maps, they don't need to be super, super high resolution. They just need to like, especially at the end of the neural network, it might just be like, does this galaxy have a bar in it? Like, you don't need to know, does it have a bar at this very specific location and that very specific location, that very specific location? You just care globally, like, does it have a bar in this galaxy? Does this galaxy have spiral arms? Like, that kind of question. And those sorts of things uh, can be accomplished by using pooling layers, which gradually, you know, at the end of each convolution uh, layer, they, they basically get, uh, they downsize the image a bit. And, you know, and just to be concrete, that's, that's often why you see CNNs represented like this. They have, like, this, like, kind of trapezoidal shape. The idea is like, you know, the height of this is like how, um, how many, uh, you know, what the, the pixel size of the feature map is and gradually it gets sort of smaller and smaller, but it gets wider and that represents that more features are being learned. So the resolution of the activation maps tend to go down, right? That tends to go down. The number of features that are learned tends to go up. And so that's why it's just represented like that. Um, at the end of a neural network, you, you still have some sort of a feature map or whatever. So you typically have what's called a fully connected layer or sometimes just a linear layer 
Um, this is just your standard, um, really just a matrix multiplication. It just goes from, you know, some number, so a whole, you know, a low resolution image or feature map. And you basically from that want to make a single prediction. And so, um, you know, you basically actually have to change this from like some two dimensional like grid into a one dimensional thing. And so oftentimes you'll, if you've used NumPy, there's a, a something called NumPy.flatten and there's basically the equivalent of that in PyTorch and you'll need to do that. That's just a technical point. Okay, so I think at this point, um, if, if you still have your, uh, 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 if you still have the notebooks running, you probably, you may or may not need um, the GPU at this part, but we're basically gonna put together a, a CNN here. And then there's two exercises here. So um, probably the best thing to do, I, I want this to be a little more interactive or a little more hands-on for, for y'all, is that, you know, go ahead and try running this code. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's some instructions here. And then if you kind of go down more, you can look at the shapes and sizes of these things. You can see what happens as I, you know, go through the pooling layers. And then there's like the, the shapes of basically the outputs at, after every layer. I find this to be very instructive. Like you'll, like <laughs> number one in my deep learning toolkit is just printing out the shapes of inputs and outputs and, you know, matrices that are like parts of the, uh, the CNN parameters and things like that. And then finally I make a prediction of, uh, you know, I, I basically make these predictions randomly initializing the, the neural network. Um, and then there's two exercises here. Uh, so I'd like you to basically go through the notebook and see if you can answer this first exercise. If you have time also take a look into the second exercise. And I'll just wander around. down this notebook so um i'm just going to quickly go over the exercises here and you know if you had a chance to go farther through the notebook no problem we're going to get there in a second uh so but for the forward pass here the question here um is that we've got a 160 by 160 input image um and then it drops down to 80 by 80 and then it drops down again 40 by 40 and so something happening in the convolution layer so uh, can any, does anyone have an idea about why it's getting tabbed each time? Did not use any pooling layers. Because of stride equals, yeah, yeah, because of stride. That's right, yeah, exactly, thank you. Um, yeah, so the stride equals two is actually a hyperparameter that we supplied when defining those layers in the neural network here. And you can see that here. Um, since I also got some questions about this, can, can you see the part that I've highlighted here? Is that a little too small? Okay, yeah. So this is um, the first convolution operator in, in that like set of layers. Uh, just to be clear, the, the, the first argument here is three. That's the number of input channels. And so what that's saying is that I need you to look at the input, which is a three by 160 by 160 image I'm um, sorry, we didn't do the cropping, although I, I've been saying 144, but it sort of is on whether we did those transformations or not, but it's three by 160 by 160. And then the second parameter is saying, what is the output? That output is 32. So it needs to learn 32 separate features to represent after you know the, the feature map after these convolution layers. The kernel size is three. So what that really is saying that the number of trainable parameters is 32 by three by three. It's learning 32 independent um, convolutional filters uh, or convolutional kernels, um, each of which are three by three in size. And then the stride two is kind of the, the key part here, which is that it's jumping, it's skipping, you know, one pixel over every time uh, it, you know, moves forward. So in other words, you know, it's not, it's not fully doing what we see here, but it's going directly from this and then skipping over to you know, and so you actually would be missing this, this little patch here. And so that's why it's getting halved in size. There's another parameter in there called pad. Padding equals one. That basically means that you just assume there are some zeros on the border of the outside. If you didn't do that, it would actually go from uh, you know, 160 by 160 down to, I don't know, 79 by 79, right? Because you wouldn't have be able to hit the edges. Um, but anyway, that's not important. Batch norm, um, 
I'm not going to talk about, and then the ReLU. So just to, to sort of reiterate, in the second set of convolutions here, we now know that the inputs of the previous layer's feature maps are of size 32 by 80 by 80, right, because those have. And we want to return something that's size, uh, which has 64 output features. Uh, and again, each of those kernels are three by threes, and then we're going to skip one because stride equals two. So like 32 and 64. So that you are choosing that? Or yeah, I chose, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so that's another good question. Um, 32 and 64, where they come from? I just made those up. It's like, they're, they're, they're decent numbers that I found to work well, but you have flexibility to choose whatever. They shouldn't be super, super high or super, super low, but this is a, a reasonable value. Is it generally advisable to use power? Oh, yeah, yeah. Is it generally advisable to use power soon? No, no, it's not, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I know. It's a little suspicious. Um, nope. They're just, I just chose those numbers. Okay, the second question is about that final layer. Um, and the question is, you know, there's something called uh, adaptive average pool 2D. So this is an actual pooling layer. We're not using strides, but we're trying to reduce the input from a 40 by 40 map down to four by four. How would you do the same thing by using, and this is a more commonly used one, uh, just average pool 2D? Any volunteers? Yeah. You have to average across the like, chunk of 10. So we got to go to the adaptive one, which is going to average the number of different outcomes. Yeah. Output channels. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. So rather than specifying the output, you just do 40 divided by 4, which is 10. And that's like the, the bin size or whatever, whatever hyperparameter is called here. Oh, it's not displaying as well as I hoped. Um, but anyway. Yeah, so you you would swap that out with kernel size equals ten using and then adaptive uh, or sorry just average pool two D. Um, by the way, there's these the answers are in these little drop down things if you haven't figured that out. So you should be able to look into there um, to see what's going on. Okay, so that's the forward pass. I'm going to go ahead and um, continue into the backwards pass. This is the optimization part where uh, the neural network is actually updated. So again, neural network is composed of these convolutional layers. Those convolutional layers have parametric, you know, model, or the, the, the parameters are contained within the kernels, right? Like the actual kernels, each of those elements of the matrices, which specify the shape that it's trying to learn, those are, those are updatable parameters. Some of the important things to keep in mind is that there's um, some, you know, so we, we said that there's a loss function and it's, it's useful to think of actually a lost landscape. So if you think a lot about op, not just optimizing deep neural networks, but any sort of optimization problem, like if you, and this is true for MCMC Monte Carlo type like explorations and things like that, you almost always have in some kind of abstract space, imagine you have some model which has some parameters um, which are specified by, so people often will call them theta for whatever reason. Um, but these are like the parameters of a model, right? Like if you have a polynomial model or something, um, you know, you, you can imagine something like this. And oftentimes yeah, I'm going to draw like kind of like a contour plot, but you'll, you'll often find that, you know, maybe what happens is the loss, which is this third dimension in here, as a function of these parameters, given the data, right, given the training data set, looks something like this. This is an example of what we call a convex problem, um, you know, you can imagine that this is sort of the lowest value. You want to get down to this point. So you minimize the loss. Uh, you can also equivalently say that this is maximizing the likelihood. If it's a, you know, if this is a likelihood formulation, it's just literally negative of the loss function. Um, and sometimes you'll see it called the negative log likelihood. Uh, but if that's the case, then, you know, whenever you basically have a model, you can say that this model is a function of its parameters, right? Like it's, the model is fully determined by its parameters. So if it's a polynomial model and it's only got these two parameters or whatever, you can basically give it a random initial spot, like a, a random initial set of things, because that's what we do with the neural network. We begin with a random initialization. Let's say it's right here. And then we basically want to say, okay, this is where it's, this is where it currently is, but this is the location it needs to be in order to minimize the the loss given the data, right? And again, we're going to evaluate something like there's a loss, which is the contours as a whole, but we want to get to a position in theta one, theta two, 
such that the loss is minimized. Um, and that's exactly what's being shown on this kind of canyon thing here. Uh, this is like, this is what a typical, you know, projected down into two dimensions. There's, you know, 10 million dimensions going on in, this is a, you know, a deep 50 layer neural network. And somewhere in, you know, these two arbitrary dimensions or this projection of 2D, there's like a, a location where the loss is, is much lower than the rest, right? And, but it, when you initialize the neural network, it could be in some, you know, corner here, very far away from that. Uh, that blue region. And in those cases, the loss is very high. So the way that I always think about like with loss landscapes is that um, you're trying to find the steepest descent into your, into this canyon. And in this canyon, this is like the, you know, the, the region where the loss is low. And so, you know, in this very simple case, you basically would want to somehow guide your model so that it goes from this bad choice of location to, you know, the, the optimum here. This is a very easy problem because this is, uh, you know, this is convex. In other words, it just, it just goes down, right? There's just a basketball, there's a single global minimum, and this can be solved using your standard linear algebra tools, or it could be done iteratively and converges very quickly. The image showed here is the case for all modern deep learning, and this is like full of pitfalls, uh, and, and it's very easy for your optimizer to get stuck. So, so a lot of tricks are, are regularly employed, a lot of heuristics, people have discovered ways to, to, to get, you know, a, a good loss out of here, but it's it's more of a art than it is a science in many ways. Um, there's some technical points about gradient descent, but the intuition here is that you, you are trying to navigate your way down to the bottom of this thing, right? This thing is specified by your model parameters given the data, given your training data. And so when you get a different batch of data, actually, that thing will morph in a little bit. Every time you grab a new training batch, it slightly changes. It wiggles around, right? And some of these like giant peaks and things like that might vanish. It's just very unstable. So we really want to come up with a way to design a neural network so that it doesn't look as intense as this. And, you know, it turns out that there are a lot of tricks that can help. One of them is by using something called residual layers, which I, I just, I'm not, I don't have the time to get into that, but the idea is that you know there are ways to design your model so that it's a lot smoother in these high dimensional spaces, and therefore you know, your optimization routines are a lot more uh, you know just a lot more effective. Um, they also tend to help with overfitting. So in the context of this is your loss landscape, you're trying to get to the bottom of it, but every time you change out your batch, it wiggles around a little bit. You can think of the the, the validation or the test set as being yet another version of this, which is unseen. And if you have a, you know, if you are applying, you know, a, a, your model to something that's totally misspecified, it's possible that your global minimum is actually in a totally wrong place. These, your data set are coming from a different type of, data, you know, they're, they're, they're basically a different data set. And that would be an example of, you know, either extrapolating your model to something that it's not supposed to be using or whatever. But, while uh, creating generalizable models by, by using a lot of the optimization tricks that, that are kind of discussed in here, um, you also actually tend to build robustness to, to like a greater range of inputs. That's just, um, that's, that's sort of another active area of research that people have been looking at. Um, and so a lot of people think about how do you widen the loss, like this basin where the loss is very low. And that, gener that gives you good generalization, even to unseen data sets. Um, the backpropagation of error, as I mentioned, is just sort of like, it's how you update the CNN. Um, I'm, I don't think I'm gonna get into it because there's a little bit more math in there, but please do feel free to read over it. Um, all the math though is taken care of by PyTorch. So what PyTorch does is for every parameter, you know, every theta or whatever here, it doesn't just keep track of the value of theta, but it also keeps track of the gradients of theta, given the data that have just been passed through. So whenever you go and, you know, evaluate a loss and it will then go back and uh, propagate those gradients, assign values to them. And those gradients are telling you this exact vector. So not only does it tell you this position that it currently has, but it tells you the vector in the direction which you, know, you wanna go in order to make the best update. And that's what PyTorch does for you. This is what Jax does for you. Um, it keeps track of these gradients. And this is actually a whole paradigm. It's called differential programming. The idea is that you want to know the derivatives towards some objective function, 
And if you can hold on to those, you can actually do a lot of things much easier. Again, MCMC, you can do model optimization, you can do all those sorts of things very quickly. You can solve partial differential equations while just writing code. And so um, in this case, it's very handy because during this update step, we want to know what all these gradients are. And so we actually just say, hey, we started off here. We know the gradient points in that direction. And this is a vector, so this is another two bits of information, right? You've got theta one, theta two, and you've got, you know, uh, uh, nabla or whatever, um, you know, the, the gradient in this direction of theta one and theta two. Um, specifically, the, the, the loss, uh, you know, which is minimized in that direction. And so it doubles the amount of information that needs to hold uh, on, on each of these parameters, but they're now trainable. And so then when you update, you go from CNN, this is at iteration I, to, uh, to iteration I plus one, the next iteration, you make that update step. And you basically take a small step in that direction. There's a hyperparameter called the learning rate, which tells you how big of a step you take. If you take a giant step here, right? Like if you scale this vector up and you go, oh, I'm gonna go that way, like way too far, that's not so good. Um, and so you actually need to choose your hyperparameter, the learning rate accordingly. Uh, and I think there's a little bit of that later on in this example. Okay, I think I'm talking a, a little too much again. So I would like you now to go through the, um, this part of the notebook, simple CNN model in action, both forward and backward pass. Uh, it actually, I, I think it's actually quite expensive to train. And that's partly because it's, it's really, it it's computationally expensive to load on the, all the data onto the GPU memory. So, so it might actually be quite slow, but if you can get, just run the, the data in the model, uh, forward pass, backward pass, read the comments, then you might be equipped to answer exercise three. Then there's also, you know, more to, to take a look at in exercise four and exercise five, as I mentioned before, is a classification example. We're going back here with our simpler neural network with uh, basically just three layers. Um, so we want to keep track of the losses. So I basically just initialized two li lists uh, and I have plugged in the training and validation loss that we computed you know, right above this uh, for the first epoch or the zeroth epoch. And then we just iterate four epoch in range. So we want to do 20 training epochs, but we could do whatever, you know, we could just do one more if we wanted. Uh, and then you have to remember um, that you can actually set model to model.train or model.eval. So you do either evaluation mode or you do training mode. It does, it's not a huge, huge difference, but sometimes there are, um, you know, internal things that will depend on the state of the model. So if it's in training mode, like you certainly want to keep track of the gradients. If you're in evaluation mode, you don't, and you actually can free up some memory that way. But there are other more complicated things that you sometimes want to keep track of. Here we've got the training loss, just set it to zero. We're setting it to zero, and then we're going to add contributions to it um, by the batch. And then what we can do is actually average over all the batches, which we'll do at the end, in order to get the loss per batch. So this is the for loop through this um, data loader. Again, this is there's a lot of complexity in that, but you should just think of the data loader as the thing that spits out at every iteration a batch of x's and a batch of y's. So this right here, getting a batch, this first step here is what we're seeing in this for loop. We then go and apply the model to, you can just call the model like this. What this really does is in the internals of the model, there's a forward function and it calls the forward function. And so basically that's the forward pass and you get the prediction. So P here, I call it P sub B, but whatever prediction equals the model applied the forward pass to uh, the first batch of X's. We can then evaluate the loss. The loss as we define is the RMSE function, the root mean squared error, and that you need your um, predictions and your ground truths. And then just because we want to 
keep track of the training loss uh, so that we can make a loss curve later. Um, we grab, uh, we basically add the training loss here. <clears throat> Note that this is a PyTorch tensor object. So actually I have to call dot item here. This is just one of these annoying things that you deal with, with like PyTorch. Um, otherwise it's got, you know, it's, it's like a tensor, it's a zero, you know, a, a rank zero tensor. So it's just a scalar or whatever. Like it, you just grab the item. And so that's training dot loss. One important thing that oftentimes, you know, um, you forget to do, uh, especially as you're starting to use PyTorch is that like when you use the optimizer, you actually need to zero out the gradients. Otherwise I'll keep track of the gradients from last time and kind of like mess it all up. So you want to zero the gradients. That is you basically reset this vector. You know, so you should think vector anytime I'm talking about gradients here. And all you have is the point um, that it's currently at. You zero it out the gradients. And then when you call loss dot backwards, this is when PyTorch does uh, computes all those partial derivatives and gives you a new set of gradients. The scale of that vector is determined by the learning rate, which I don't remember where it is here. I even make an optimizer. Where's the optimizer? Oh, here it is. Whoops, I was supposed to stick that in there. Okay, sorry, I forgot about that part. So there's also an optimizer, um, which is in this case stochastic gradient descent. Stochastic just means that we're, it's stochastic because we're sampling mini batches. And so we're just getting batches of data. We're not doing the entire set of data at a time. Um, so it's sometimes called mini batch gradient descent. And this just needs to know about the model parameters and it's, you supply a learning rate. So the learning rate LR is again, that hyper prior tells you the, the scale of the vector. Um, so how big of a step size to take. So I should, good thing I zeroed it out, but in, you know, what I really need to do is make sure that goes in there. Um, and you know, uh, redefine the optimizer in, in case it's you know a relic from before. Um, it's, it's, can it be this one that optimizer like what it is doing? If you don't put what? Yeah. So uh, what it's doing is, if you have, all right, let me see if I can do this real quick. I mean, so if you have like some theta, like let's just call it sub j um, at time at iteration i plus one. You want to update that with theta, you know, j times that i plus derivative of this with respect to uh, the, sorry, derivative of the loss with respect to theta. Is that right? Right. I think it was right. Yeah, with respect to theta of j. So you need to check my, let me, I'm just making sure I have the symbols right here. But you're, it's basically just doing this update step, and then plus times times some pre factor, which is the learning rate. So sometimes that's called eta, which is just the learning rate, and that's just the scale of that vector. How big you, you go? Let me see if I have so this. In the beginning of the probe, like iteration, it, it's optimizing the feature. It's the it's beginning. it's updating it's updating all the parameters in the CNN. Oh, so every one of those is updated. Yeah, sorry. So it's a negative sign, whatever, right? Let's go by negatives and positives, but whatever. So, so you, you subtract it apparently. And you, but the idea is that, you know, if you start off here and you take a step size, to, you know, based on where the step is in the direction determined by this vector, um, then you're, you know, you're going to take something with scale determined by the learning rate and with direction determined by this gradient, uh, the loss landscape. Um, sorry, I know that's a lot, but that's that's what the so the optimizer does. That it's the thing that like knows like this is the process by which I do the the, the updates. But when you call the loss function dot backward, it's actually that's where all these um, you know partial derivatives, this gradient term, is being computed here. Uh, it's like I, I know I'm like being very hand wavy with like the calculus part. It's because I don't want to bore you guys with the calculus. <laughs> like you, there are plenty of papers that you can read where like you know people will go through the math in detail. But as I said, I'm all about throwing the ball at my child and seeing what happens. And, um, okay. So then um, and then the optimizer dot step. So the optimizer tells you this is the rule that we use to do up, uh, updates. But then the actual step is where you populate. Um, the optimizer. Okay, and then we can pass through the validation uh, set because we just did the training epoch, but we haven't actually checked to see how well it does in the validation side. So you can do, uh, so with torch.nodegrad, that 
you know, make sure that no gradients are being formed because when you're doing validation, you don't want to train on your validation set. That would be cheating. Uh, and we, so we can do a with torch dot no grad context. We can evaluate the model. And then we just basically do the same thing we just did, except that we're not going to run the optimizer at all. We're going to evaluate the forward pass on the validation set, right? So the batch from this is here, the training set, but we could do the same thing for the validation set and same deal. We just keep track of those sorts of things. Here's some print statements and you can see that it does okay. No, whatever. Yeah. So, so if we remove the torch dot no grad function, the model updates every time we iterate? Um, that's a good question. So if I didn't do this, uh, no, it wouldn't actually. So, so it's in the evaluation mode and I'm not calling the optimizer at all, okay. but I, uh, yeah, I, I'm not hundred percent sure on this. I'm guessing that it would still keep the gradients. So the amount of memory footprint would be doubled because you're keeping two, yeah, exactly. You're keeping two bits of information for each of these. Um, any other questions or thoughts? So this is a lot. Um, I, I, I recognize that this is a lot to, to take in, in in under three hours. Um, and you know, I fully my hope my hope here is that I can provide you with you know the first couple of cells, which tell you how do you use fast AI to like load a couple of things in and get data into you know a usable format so you can quickly see that the CNN will be trainable. I also provide you down here. This actually I don't think this uses. So this doesn't use fast AI whatsoever. This is just a pure PyTorch formulation using um, a set of simulated galaxies. Uh, this is, you know, uh, by Alex uh, Ciprianovich at all, at all um, from Fermilab um, and her paper. But uh, I basically just redid her model, except in PyTorch because hers is in TensorFlow, and you can basically see, you know, this is um, basically some simulated galaxies, which are either mergers or not mergers. There's sort of noise added to this image, and then you can go ahead and try to form a classification example. And there's an answer key here as well. Um, I guess there's, there's minimal uh, fast AI, which is used for loading the data, but that's that's just, you know, for convenience. Everything else uh, in that example is done, I think, using, actually, maybe it is using fast AI, but anyway, I can't remember. Oh yeah, it is, I'm sorry. Well, anyhow, the point is though, you have a, a classification example to build off of, you have a regression example to build off of, and as always, I am very happy to help uh, if you want to set up any sort of deep learning pro problem, especially with CNNs today. And tomorrow I'll talk about GNNs, graph neural networks. I, I'm all ears. I would love to, to assist you in your research happen. So I think it's a few minutes till noon and I'll, I'll leave it off here. Thank you.